Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today we're starting our introduction to signaling games. Let's begin by recapping where we are in our unit on perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Previously, we've looked at screening games. And the reason we started with screening games is because they're fairly simple. These are situations where uninformed actors move first. As a consequence of the person with a secret acting last, there was nothing that could be conveyed about private secret information in the initial move by the uninformed actor. This made the rest of the game really straightforward to calculate. There was some sort of uncertainty and some sort of guessing about what could be the case, but there was nothing to be learned by the initial action. And that's the opposite of what we see in signaling games. In signaling games, the person with information, the informed actor, moves first. And the reason we call these things signaling games is because the action that the informed actor takes might tell something to the uninformed actor. It might send the uninformed actor a signal. So there's going to be more complicated learning going on in these signaling games, and that's something that we haven't seen in screening games at all before. I'm going to start off our discussion of signaling games over the next few lectures with the simplest class of signaling games. And the simplest class of signaling games are two-player, two-type, and two-action. Let's take a look at an example of one of these. We're not actually going to solve this game today, but I want you to get you familiar with what these things look like and also discuss the types of equilibria you can have in signaling games based off of this. So you'll notice that I only have a complete game here. We don't have payoffs. We just have the structure of the moves. Signaling games begin with nature drawing a type of one of the players. So in this case, it's going to be either a high type or a low type. We have a 0.5 below each of those to represent the fact that each of those is equally likely in this case. After nature draws a type, player one chooses whether to go to college or just get a high school diploma. And then player two can hire or pass. So this is an employment game. Player one wants to get a job, and player two wants to maybe hire player one, or maybe not. Now, this is a signaling game because player one observes his type. He knows whether nature has endowed him with high capacity or low capacity. Player two is in the dark. Player two does not observe nature's decision, but she observes something else. Namely, she observes what player one's action was, whether he went to college or whether he just stuck with high school. So player one's decision to either go to college or go to high school might send a signal to player two and help player two learn something about player one's type. Let's talk about the three different types of perfect Bayesian equilibria in signaling games. There's separating equilibria, pooling equilibria, and what can be called either semi-separating or partially pooling equilibria. Those two are the same. For this class, I'll be referring to it as semi-separating equilibria, but what your professor or your textbook might call partially pooling equilibrium is also called semi-separating equilibrium. They're the same thing. Now, to be very clear, each of these things is a type of perfect Bayesian equilibrium. These are subsets of perfect Bayesian equilibrium. But they have special names in these signaling games because they represent what's going on with the strategies of the informed player. So let's take a look at some example separating strategies, what you might observe in a separating equilibrium. So obviously, again, we're not actually solving for equilibria here because we don't have payoffs. We can't do that yet, and I haven't taught you how to do that yet anyway. But I want you to get comfortable with what a separating strategy is versus a pooling strategy versus a semi-separating strategy. So here, this separating strategy has involved the high type going to college and the low type only going to high school. Now, we call this a separating strategy because think about what player two can infer here. If player two observes player one going to college, and these are the strategies that the players are taking, then player two knows that player one is the high type by virtue of the fact that he went to college. That's the only way player two can observe college happening, is if player one went with this high type. Nature drew player one as a high type. Now, in contrast, if player two observes just high school, the only way that can occur given these strategies is if nature drew player one as a low type. So the high type and the low type are separating themselves by choosing different strategies. And this gives player two a lot of information. We'll start with this in the next lecture, because this is actually the simplest version of perfect Bayesian equilibria in signaling games to solve for. Separating equilibria are fairly easy to do, so we're going to start simple, and that's going to be the subject of our next lecture. That's separating strategies. 
Let's now look at pooling strategies. So pooling strategies are different from separating strategies. In fact, they're basically the opposite. Instead of taking opposite actions, they take the same action. So in this case, these pooling strategies that I have put into the game right now are both the high type and the low type just choosing to go to high school. Now, given that that's the case, when player two sees that player one has gotten a high school diploma, she doesn't really learn anything from this. Because regardless of whether player one was a high type or a low type, they're taking the same action. They're both going to high school. They're never going to college. So player two can't really update her information here because the high type and the low type have pooled. They've jumped into the same pool of the high school strategy. Pooling strategies are somewhat more complicated than separating strategies. It might look initially that this is fairly straightforward as well because they're just adopting the same strategy. But it's a little bit more complicated because we have to worry about what happens if player one were to have chosen the opposite strategy, in this case, had gone to college. If you think back to our unit on subgame perfect equilibrium, one of the key parts of that is that the strategy had to be a complete and contingent plan of action. You had to describe not only what happens in equilibrium, but what would happen off the equilibrium path. It's the same idea with perfect Bayesian equilibria. Perfect Bayesian equilibria are still covering these extensive form games. So we have to describe what happens off the path. But it's more complicated here for the following reason. Strategies in perfect Bayesian equilibria depend on the beliefs that the individual has when the individual makes a move. In this case, we would have to give player two some sort of strategy for what would happen if she had observed player one going to college, but it's difficult to pin down what her belief should be under those circumstances because player one is never actually supposed to go to college in these pooling strategies. So we're going to see that that's complicated not only in terms of defining what a perfect Bayesian equilibrium is for pooling strategies, but also what we should and shouldn't believe. So we're going to see actually a bunch of different lectures on these what's called off the equilibrium path beliefs coming up after we've learned about separating strategies, pooling strategies, and semi-separating strategies. Now, speaking of semi-separating strategies, that's the last one. So this is strategically the coolest. And it's unfortunate because oftentimes semi-separating strategies get left out at the end of classes in game theory. This is what you would learn at the very end of most semesters, and so oftentimes professors just don't have time to go through it. But it's actually the most strategically richest of these options, separating, pooling, and semi-separating. This is definitely the coolest. This is what you might actually think of as true bluffing behavior. So in this case, it's semi-separating because one type is doing something somewhat similar to the other type, but also somewhat dissimilar. In this case, the high type is always going to college as a pure strategy. The low type is sometimes going to college, 30% of the time, and sometimes going to high school, 70% of the time. So think about what this means for player two's inference. If player two observes high school, the only way that could have happened is if player one was this low type. In contrast, if player two observes college, then there are two different ways that could have happened. It could be that player one is a high type. It could also be that player one is a low type that just happened to go to college. So she should be updating her belief to some degree, and that's why we're going to have the Bayes rule come back into play here, because we're going to have to have player two update her belief about what player one's type is, having observed college. But it's going to be different than what her prior belief was at the beginning of the game when nature made that move initially, and player one had not observed, or rather player two had not observed player one taking an action yet. So that's semi-separating strategies for you. And those are, again, the three different types of strategies that we can look at in perfect Bayesian equilibria. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the types of strategies and the types of equilibria that we can see in signaling games. And I hope to see you next time when we start looking at how to solve for separating equilibria in these signaling games. Take care.